So when I was in school, I used to think some kids were just naturally more intelligent than me. There'd be these kids before exams wouldn't have to do any studying. And for some reason, I thought that on a couple of occasions, I would be able to get away with this very thing. And yeah, it didn't ever work out when I, when I tried to copy them. In the book, Mindset by Carol Dweck, she argues a couple things. And these mainly are that there's two types of people. They're people with a fixed mindset and they're people with a growth mindset. Fixed mindset people believe that they can't change their attitude towards things because the beliefs are rooted into well, specific things really. And then the growth mindset is where you can continually improve and get better at something, no matter how crap you might be to start off with. This book has been a really good read for a couple of reasons, mainly because it has taught me that talent is something not to be relied upon. I think we have this idea that people are either born with certain skills or gifts or they do not exist at all. This book has a very powerful message that anyone can rise to the occasion no matter what happens to them in life. Here are a couple of reasons why you should develop a growth mindset. Now I think we all know the story about Christopher Reeve, he was the OG Superman, very, very talented actor. And as we know what happened to him, he was tragically paralysed after he was thrown from a horse. However, he started doing a lot of exercises that electrically allowed him to move his arms and legs again. And that just begs the question, like how bad would you commit to something, no matter how bad the odds look? And this is something that a lot of students come face to face with when they go to university, especially if it's a really good one. Even if their scores and their grades going into university are exceptional, I think a lot of students can feel like they don't deserve to be there or that they can't succeed at any new challenges. And this is a classic case of something called imposter syndrome. And imposter syndrome usually happens when you're starting something new, like if you started a new job. And this is the notion that it's not your own efforts or hard work that got you to that place, but it's more something arbitrary like luck or just happy coincidence. The saying is becoming is better than being, which is the idea that every journey is at the end of the day a process that we all go through and it's not the destination that matters most. It's very easy to blame your lack of success or even failure on things that are nothing to do with you. There's the tennis player John McEnroe who uh, blamed distractions on the court. You can't be serious man, you cannot be serious! and even the sawdust not being good enough to stop his hands from sweating during play. Other sports personalities like Michael Jordan succeeded because he wasn't a natural talent. But through practice and practice, he managed to understand how not just to become great, but how to stay great. I'm going back to what I said about school at the beginning of the video. A lot of kids don't want to go to education with a lot of aggression because they're worried about not doing well. So it's this whole uh, attitude that they don't have to put any effort into things because if you put effort into things and you fail, it's just embarrassing. You might as well not waste your time at all. Come to think of it, this is something that I'm a little bit guilty of now. This year I kind of procrastinated with my boxing match just because I didn't think I was fit enough. I didn't think I was ready and I was just going through that whole perfectionist thing. And another thing in school as well is the fact that kids usually get grouped into classes. That might actually affect their esteem. Like if they're in the bad class, obviously the teachers aren't going to be paying as much attention to the children because they're not going to be doing as well, they won't be getting the good grades. So they have this mentality that they can never improve within their subjects, which is really damaging. Pat Summit, a coach for Tennessee's women's basketball team, once said, Success lulls you, it makes the most ambitious of us complacent and sloppy. And that's the thing, success and winning isn't always the, the best way forward, but it's what we do to become successful which matters most. What Dwight makes clear is that it's not just about putting in the effort. You have to continually be changing your plans if they're not working, continually changing making sure that you're on the right course at all times. It's also what Dwight mentions is that it's not about mimicking. You're not, you know, doing the whole uh, like fake it till you make it thing. Anyone can memorize information going into an exam. That might work for you like when you're early on in school. But if you're studying for a PhD or you're doing your degree or whatever it might be, you need to understand the flow and the context of the information that you're being provided. In this perfectionist world that we live in, there's something that is really admirable about someone who's got the humility to do something even though they're not going to be uh, acing it with flying colours. It is said in the book, what I mean is that even when you think you're not good at something, you can still plunge into something because you're not good at it. This is a wonderful feature of the growth mindset. 
You don't have to think you're already great at something to want to do it and enjoy doing it. And we should also not give people false praise. I mean, let's be honest, like most people, most people want to be told that they're awesome. That is just a fact of life. However, if someone's just constantly told how awesome they are, their confidence will go out the window if they're actually challenged with a problem. And this goes into this whole pity narrative, that it becomes easy for us to feel sorry for ourselves or blame things on factors that have nothing to do with the situation. And what Dweck also notes about growth mindset people is that their heads are not filled with limiting thoughts a fragile sense of belonging and the belief that other people can define them. Also in studies by Claudia Steele and Joshua Aronson, certain factors like a participant ticking a box in a study that indicates they're black or a female can actually lower their test scores. Other factors as well, like if a woman is in a room full of men can negatively affect her performance in this situation. And there's also in the book, there's this interview of this child who's um, interviewed in a growth mindset school and he said that we do hard things here, they fill your brain. And that's what I actually think is really cool is that you gain an appetite for doing hard things when, after a while when you've got this growth mindset. There's actually the story of Mother Collins who notes that she was um, teaching her kids at school to embrace hard challenges and even learning to read very sort of complex works at very young ages like Shakespeare, Machiavelli, like the Wall Street Journal. This is not stuff that seven year olds should be learning. <laughs> but as, as you know, as the saying is that when the going gets tough, the tough get going. And that's what I love about Carol Dweck's idea of teaching. It's not to impose your knowledge on your students, but it's also to help teach yourself. And I think it's a really motivating thing. Now, I think we all know about the successful story about Muhammad Ali, one of the most prolific boxers of all time. And I think what most of us don't tend to remember is the, the absolute extreme scrutiny that he had going over him when he was first like making the rounds. Certain things were discriminated against, like his race, his fist size, his height, his boxing style. He'd leave his chin out in a really obvious way, and for those that don't know boxing, that's how you get knocked out. But when going up against Sonny Liston, Muhammad Ali did his homework. He studied his opponent meticulously, looking for strategies to take him down. And this is the thing, is that on paper, Liston had everything going for him. The talent, the size, the, the record. But what Muhammad Ali had was a manufactured mindset, which Sonny could not compete with. This is the mental versus the physical side of fighting, which is equally as important at times. And going back to Michael Jordan, and not a lot of people know is that he was actually cut from the high school varsity team, but no one knew who he would become. Before school, he would be shooting hoops, he'd be practicing for like ages, hours. I think it's easier to see things that are physical. Everyone can see muscles, everyone can see the fast cars, everyone can see the, the fashionable clothes that someone's wearing, but not a lot of people can see the grit, the determination and the courage that people have to persist despite everything going against them. And the growth mindset is meant to do what it says in the tin. Like when I do boxing, whether that's um, doing sparring, whether that's doing 1v1 on the bag where you're trying to outlast your opponent. When I see my opponent is getting tired, that's what gives me energy because I know that it's I'm not the strongest person. I'm not the fittest person, but I'm always going to try and outlast people no matter what that is. And I think that's just the stubborn side of me that I've I guess kind of picked up on this boxing journey. I don't know if it's, um, they're, they're both linked, but I like to think so. Carol Dweck mentions Billie Jean King in her tennis game against Margaret Smith. And when Billie Jean King was being beaten during uh, this particular match, she realized what makes a champion. When the match is on the line, they suddenly get around three times tougher. And this is an ideal that I think builds character. It's not about if you're succeeding or failing, but it's it's about pushing yourself and feeling that pressure. And I think this is very apparent in a sports where you're not on a team, like in boxing or like in tennis, where you don't have anyone to fall back on but yourself. Like obviously your coaches can help you and like mentor you from the sidelines, but you're out on your own. You're, you're, you're there with your own instincts. Alan Wurzel, the CEO of Circuit Chain, was also mentioned in the book as a man who wouldn't just look to impress the boardroom or seem likeable to his executive team. What he would do time and time again was question their process rather than let it slide into mediocrity. And as some of you business heads know, companies like Enron did not take notice of their shortcomings and they 
Oh, no one knows about Enron anymore. I mean, a lot of you probably haven't heard of Enron. This is probably the first time you're hearing of this company. And this is why evolving on the surface, it doesn't really count. Like if you've got six pack abs and you've got high blood pressure, like can't really uh, be going with that for too long. Dweck also notes in the book is Lee Iacocca, uh, the former CEO of Ford Company, the absolute automobile uh, monolith. After being forced out of the company, he eventually went to Chrysler and became their CEO. But even at this new company, he was labelled as a tyrant and unaccountable. He struggled to gain loyalty from his workers and being seen as a good market leader. Another example is Steve Case and Jerry Levin of AOL and Time Warner. They were both CEOs, but they had this bully tactic of firing people that were not team players or agreed with the way that they were doing things. But this all ended in 2002 for AOL when they had a crazy amount of debt, which ended in the largest yearly loss seen in American history. And this was close to a hundred billion dollars. And this is why that only people before the 2000s remember what AOL is now. And Carol Dweck sometimes mentions that the most loyal employees for a company are usually the people that suffer the most. Because a leader with a fixed mindset may see these people with a growth mindset and are loyal uh, as competition, people that are gonna threaten their position. But this is the thing is that no matter what organization you're in, we all have the power to be better at our jobs. We all have the power to be better leaders, better managers, better CEOs. Teamwork is less about the uh, collaboration of people, but it's more of people embracing change and improvement. If people embrace better moral values, they're less likely to adopt a fixed mindset, which is gonna lead to corruption and a bad work environment. And in relationships, having a fixed mindset can have a really detrimental effect. And this is the issue with people with fixed mindsets when they're going into a relationship, is that they expect their partner to be perfect upon meeting them. Like it's a, like it's a fairy tale. Like we, we should be more accepting of people's flaws. Just because someone has bad qualities, does that mean we have to accept them? That, not, no. <laughs> Dwight mentions a psychiatrist called Aaron Beck, who had to say that this is the belief that harms couples the most. If we need to work at it, there's something seriously wrong with our relationship. And I guess this is the whole thing, is the idea of our, if we're compatible or not. Like I've been in relationships where it's ended because we seemingly weren't compatible or I thought someone wasn't compatible. But you shouldn't approach the relationships with the idea like it's, you know, your favorite team losing a match. Like you get up and leave because you're like, oh, you know, want to beat the traffic on the way home. And if you know something's deep down worth fighting for, you should stay with the, the bad parts of a relationship. You should be willing to persist and try and overcome things that are fixable. And that's the thing, uh, not to say that people are bad in a relationship, but not all of us are actually naturals or talented at managing relationships. Some of that comes with a bit of experience and also a bit of education. Some of the intentions might be really pure, like they may be emotional people, but they don't know how to express themselves. But that's no reason to break up with this person or think that they are unimprovable, like everyone wants to improve. You know, that's the thing, as I was speaking to my friend about this, and I think he was saying something along the lines that, uh, I think it was, uh, most people are looking for more reasons to not be in a relationship than to be in a relationship. It's not the right time, I'm too busy, work's too full on. All in all, I think uh, the time is never gonna be up perfect with anything, let's be honest. And I think this book has taught me a lot, and ever since I first read it, which was, um, you know, it was almost a year ago, it's taught me a lot about how to approach my life and that's the thing is that you're never as bad or as good as you think you are and the thing with growth is that is you know it's ever expansive you can always get better you can always improve and that's why I, I do recognize as well that you can have a growth mindset with quite a few things uh, but also have a fixed mindset in others uh, for example I have a fixed mindset with meditation and yoga but fitness I'm, uh, I'm usually okay and I guess there's always things about ourselves that um, things that we wish we could change, but we actually can't in our lifetime. It's, these are things that are, are permanent. But the things we can change and can improve, don't stop. But if you're new to this channel, my name is Chris. I make content like this weekly. And if you like this, comment, like, and subscribe, and I'll see you in the next video. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.